Hello and welcome to the First Shadow Kingdom's Ghost of the Past recap. This is the recap of Episode 1, Season 1. These recaps will be in the form of journal entries written by Wilkins Thornfoot, a military officer who is journeying with the adventurers. The Shattered Kingdom setting started out as a world for the live-action roleplay game AmpGuard. I run a yearly event where this world takes center stage. With the pandemic and us not being able to meet, I thought it would be a fun idea to explore the Shattered Kingdom's world through Dungeons & Dragons. I hope you join us on our adventure and have as much fun as we are having. So let us begin. This is Volume 1 of the Military Journal of Wilkins Thornfoot. I will attempt to keep a record of the six-month mission as per my orders. I am journeying with a group of hired adventurers to scout out the region of Eremos. We are to gain as much intel about the people, land, and government as possible in an effort to determine if they should be brought into the Empire. If so, our intel will determine how best to proceed. Second Day of Brogner, 485 AGU Today I met up with the adventurers in the northern region of the Empire, Oromos, at the Teacup Inn. The Manconian Adventurers Guild did an adequate job finding the adventurers for this mission. Lawrence Venthyr, human, is an academic from the Hadabrandian University. He is relatively untested, but I am told he is competent from some surprisingly high-ranking officials. Lance Stormfield, another human, is something of a hero in his region. He has earned several medals and by all accounts is a very competent warrior, although he has earned a reputation to draw on about his achievements at every opportunity. Lauren is a half-orc, and by all accounts, an exceptional one. He has broken the stereotypes and made a name for himself as a detective. He used to be in the City Watch. I think he will be a great asset on this mission. Then there is Julian, the Syndicate Turncoat. He is less than ideal. I'm sure he's competent enough in his skills, and those skills might even be helpful, but I fear he can't be trusted. I was resistant to allow him to come on this mission, but once it was settled, I made sure I was leading it. He needs to stay alive, and most importantly, we need to know where to contact him when it's time for him to testify against his former compatriots. He does not know I'm partially here to keep an eye on him and make sure if he survives. I thought it best to make sure he had no idea he had someone who knows who he really is. 23rd Day of Brogner, 45 AGU The last two weeks have gone smoothly. There is nothing to note. All the adventurers seem to be getting along fine, and I found out firsthand that it is in fact true that Lance does, on occasion, tend to draw off. Today we met up with Virgis at the town of Loxhor, the furthest city any Manconian official has ever traveled, and the last decent sized town for the next week or so of our travels. We plan on taking a day of rest tomorrow before traveling on. Virgis is one of the representatives from the Manconian Adventurers Guild. The organization is responsible for hiring the adventurers and for running the place of operation in Aramis. They are responsible for making sure the adventurers can best execute their job. Virgis, Menace, and the Medjodromo Marcade are the only people that know why we are really going to Aramis. In total, there will be eight of us who know our true intentions. More than I like, but the best we could manage. Virgis has been waiting for us, so he can lead us the rest of the way to Irmos, and to where they have bought an inn and tavern called the Brass Cup. They have been in Irmos for several months, setting up the base. Apparently, they had enough money to start renovating the property. It sounds like it will be more luxurious than I was expecting, or for what we needed. The 25th day of Brogner, 45 EGU. I hoped we would travel to Irmos without any issues, but I fear that something would happen. Today it has. As we were preparing to leave Luxor, Lauren decided to inform us that he had some business in town that was not concluded. He told us to continue and that he would catch up to us when he was done. Sixth day of Furrow Beard, 45 AGU. Today we arrived in Aramos. The view cresting the hill was amazing. Before us was the ruins of a magnificent city, one that would have rivaled any city in the Empire. The great upheaval hit this area hard. It looks like it used to be a port town. I say used to because what must have been a bay at one point was now filled with I say used to because what must have been a bay at one point is now filled with spiky barren islands, making it hard to traverse. And the water looks stagnant and covered in water greenery. It also looks like a great river once flowed here. On the way to town we rode over a bridge at least a hundred feet long and arched high. All that remained below was a small creek and some swamp land. 
We took the road around the city to the main road and entered through the main gate. We rode through the ruins until we eventually arrived at the old city center. The gates were open and we were waved through. It should be noted they have been renovating the defensive walls. It should be noted that they have been renovating the defensive walls of the inner city. The town was full of people and for some reason a great many chickens. We went to the noble district, a gated and guarded community, but with no obvious restrictions to entry. Despite the name, the district is home to a variety of noble houses that have been converted to inns and taverns. Our destination, the Brass Cup, was off the main road, but not far from the main district's gate. We were introduced to Marcade, the major domo who started giving us a tour. We began with the tavern, which used to be the antechamber and main hall of the building. He introduced us to the barkeep, Brevin, a rather surly red-headed dwarf. He was the former owner of the establishment. Next, we went into the kitchen and we were introduced to Portia, who was cooking a stew and baking bread for lunch. From there, we went to the newly renovated cellar. They must have hit some sort of shaft when renovating because as Dueling walked over near the wall, it crumbled away and he fell into a secret layer under the building. Below, they found a goblin they named Marshmallow, and more surprisingly, a portal for a faraway place. We walked through the portal and found ourselves in a large circular room with what looked like eight dormant portals, plus the one active portal we walked through. After searching the area, we found no one, but the area was heavily used. After searching the area, we found no one, but Yulian discovered that the structure was heavily used. Other than the portal room, there were stairs leading up, but they were blocked. Other than the portal room, there were stairs leading up, but they were blocked by a vein of heartstone. Then there were another 30 rooms along a hallway surrounding the circular room. In the first one, there was a natural tunnel that had been widened. However, there was a cave-in that occurred when Yulian approached the room. I find it dubious that it was a natural occurrence. We spent the next two hours removing rocks. Eventually, we broke through to the other side. Whoever was there was gone. We found a ruined hovel that had been built up against the rock side. Leading away from the rubble was a set of wagon tracks. It was heading into an outcropping of trees off in the distance. Lawrence determined that we were probably several miles away from Eremus, which I concur with. There was a mountain range off in the distance that looked similar to the one I could see from Eremus. The adventurers let Marshmallow go. The intent was to follow him, and we did. We followed the tracks, which eventually turned onto a road. We followed the road until we came to a village. A village inhabited by goblins and orcs. I'd never seen their like before. I fought goblins and orcs plenty, but I've never seen them live in houses like these, or wear clothes like what they wore. The greenskins that I'm aware of mostly live in caves and wear whatever they can get their hands on. The goblins here were wearing nice, if simple clothing, mostly well taken care of. Additionally, these greenskins were not hostile, nor did they appear to fear us. We were confronted by the mayor, a goblin named Cracklin. He persuaded the adventurers to take a job to deal with some kobolds that were crossing the town. The mayor said the kobolds had killed a messenger trying to offer peace. However, I find this claim to be dubious. Cracklin put us up for the night at the local inn. Lawrence gathered some information from Ulog, the male orc bartender. There seems to be some trouble with the kobolds, but Ulog knew nothing about any deaths. 7th day of Furrowbeard, 45 EGU. The next morning, we ate our breakfast and headed out. We visited a farmer who had been attacked by kobolds. Through interrogating the goblin owner, who had been injured, as well as investigating the barn and Lawrence talking to a squirrel, the adventurers determined that there really had been a recent attack. By all counts, there were five kobolds, despite the goblins saying that there were ten. They came here, beat up the owner, and stole food and seeds. We then followed Cracklin's directions to the kobolds. We went down the road till we saw a tree that looked like a giant. Then we turned right till we hit a brook. We followed it upstream till we found an outcropping of rocks, at which point we went left, and in about a mile we found some ruins. There was one large building in the middle with a wall around it and some old stone outbuildings. We decided to set up camp, even though it was only early afternoon, so that we could send Yulin in to scout the area when it became dark. So ends the first episode of Shattered Kingdom's Ghosts of the Past. If you enjoyed it, consider liking and subscribing. If you'd like to watch live, we play on Twitch once a month on Sunday. Our next game is Sunday, March 28th, 2021, between 12 and 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. To be notified of our gaming schedule and to be informed of other projects, you may join the Bailnorn Discord server. 
Links are provided in the description below. Again, thank you for taking your time and watching this video. Until next time.